All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 24th episode of Insights Webinar. Um, this is a webinar series hosted by eHealth Africa. And um, this platform enables us to have insightful conversations with public health professionals on issues and pathways for improved public health delivery. My name is Tijes Wojumu, and I'm happy to be your host for this conversation. Now, quickly into the background of today's uh, discussion. In recent times, digital health conversations have increasingly focused around optimizing and integrating existing solutions to improve disease surveillance and preparedness to achieve improved impact. Now, this is not unconnected to the fact that the world, and especially the African region, has endured a series of public health emergencies and disease outbreaks which required urgent responses. So just last month, uh, if for those that follow us closely, you will notice that we did not have um, the Insights webinar. However, what we had was the Insights Learning Forum. And that was the second edition. The Insight Learning Forum is an annual event dedicated to advancing digital health in public health practice. And so we had that edition uh, on 31st of July. Um, this year it was an awesome meeting. And so this 24th episode of Insights Webinar will build on conversations about digital transformation in public health practice, especially focusing on the innovations, the lessons, and the impact. So we're excited, I am excited, you know, to take the conversation from that forum and bring to this webinar, you know, to expand on some of the ideas that were dropped that we could not really get into uh, into the details of, you know. Um, so I want to just welcome you again. And um, right now I'm going to get into introducing our esteemed guests, our panelists. Uh, we have them with us right now. And so as I introduce you, please kindly unmute your mic and say hello to everyone. After introducing the panelists, um, we're going to play a very short video. And after the short video, we're going to jump into the question and answer session. So if you know anyone that should be on this um, on this webinar uh, meeting, if you know anyone who you know needs to listen to what we're talking about today, if you know someone who is really interested in this, a friend, a colleague, please send the link for this webinar to them. Um, let me also let you know that we are live on LinkedIn, so you can also share across your contact and your network on LinkedIn. All right, so let me introduce our first guest. Um, the first person I'll be introducing is none other than the Senior Digital Health Advisor at Health Enabled, and also the co-convener is none other than Dr. Emeka Chuku. Um, Dr. Mecca Chuku is the Senior Digital Health Advisor at Health Enabled. He is a multidisciplinary digital health professional with over 20 years of experience in digital public health practice, software development, teaching, and research. He has extensive experience building digital health and innovation systems in communities. He has also led the drafting of national and subnational digital health strategies and roadmaps in Africa. Um, Dr. Emeka's PhD is focused on the intelligent exchange of health information in low resource environment. He currently chairs the standard organization of Nigeria Technical Committee on Medical Services. And he, like I earlier said, is the co-convener of the Digital Health Interoperability Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let us put our hands together or click on your emojis to celebrate Dr. Emeka Chuku. Dr. Emeka Chuku, please unmute your mic and say hello to everyone. Thank you very much, TJ Shu, and hello, everyone. Thank you, sir. All right, up next is the Vice President, Clinical Services and Chief Medical Officer of the EHA Clinic, none other than Dr. Ifunaya Ilodibe. Dr. Ifunaya is an experienced physician leader and healthcare operations professional with expertise in clinical practice, healthcare management, and quality assurance. As the Vice President of Clinical Services and Chief Medical Officer at EHA Clinics, she ensures high quality healthcare delivery and safe practices with a background in medical science and a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from the University of Ghana. She brings extensive clinical knowledge to her role. 
Dr. Elodie B excels in clinical team supervision, performance management, recruitment, financial stewardship, and customer satisfaction. She has a master's degree in international health management and leadership from the University of Sheffield. She is a certified practitioner of healthcare quality from the National Association of Healthcare Quality in the United States, and she's certified as a lead auditor. Can you please put your hands together or tap on your emoji to welcome Dr. Ifunaya Ilodibi. Dr. Ifunaya, you're very much welcome. Please say hello to everyone. Thank you so much, CJ Sue. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we're glad to have you, Dr. Ifunaya. All right, last but not the least, definitely not the least, is the general manager, GE Healthcare West Africa. is none other than Dr. George Uduku. Dr. George is the general manager, GE Healthcare West Africa. He has extensive experience in strategy, new market entry, project development, sales management. Um, Dr. George drives a coherent strategy across GE Healthcare business in West Africa. Prior to GE, he held several leadership roles at Philips Healthcare businesses in West Africa. And over a 10 year period, he focused on commercial processes and project development. He also worked in venture capital in the United States. Dr. George holds a medical degree from the University of Calabar and an MBA with distinction from Holt International Business School, Boston. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. George. Hello, Dr. George. Thank you very much, TJ. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. All right. Thank you very much. And so that is our lineup of panelists for this afternoon's conversation. It's going to be interesting. I can promise you that. Um, so just before we go into the question and answer session, we have um, queued up um, a short video for us to watch. So um, if you could please put up the video IT. Um, we're on standby to watch. And so please don't touch your dial. Don't leave your phone or your computer. Once the video finishes, we'll be back here and then we can jump into the meat of today's conversation. Thank you. Welcome to Inside Learning Forum 2024. It's my honor to stand here before you as the moderator of this conversation. Uh, my name is Tijesu Ojumu, and I'm very privileged and happy to be here. This is a convening of strategic minds towards reshaping the public health scene in Nigeria. What we have done is bring together experts practitioners and policymakers to share ideas, share knowledge, forge connections, and most importantly, inspire innovation. The plan is for us to take those learnings from here and then actually make the change that we want to see. Thank you so much once again, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of today and this event to bring value to you. And it's very nice that we're having new persons, you know, um, join us on this particular digital health uh, cruise um, to really drive an agenda. And we're we'll to hear some of those conversations this morning. It's cultural sensitivity and inclusivity that actually supports um, user adoption. And that's where private sector partnership comes in because we have an agreement with Airtel to give free airtime. They were able to call the platform at no cost. They were also able to speak and listen in their preferred languages. I think that was the singular reason for the success of that implementation. But my question with regards to the blockchain framework is, is there any use case for blockchain for interoperability right now anywhere in the world? The kind of stakeholders we have here are the kind of networks that I require to, you know, take one pigment in the next level. So top of my list is network. And then second, of course, is to learn. Now, let's give ourselves a round of 
It's always great to be in a room with like minds discussing digital health and you know as a segue innovation and improvement within the digital health space so I've learned a lot I've met a lot of new partners potentially knock wood and I have a lot of takeaways you know that I hope will improve my own implementation of digital health at my facility we need to move away from talking to implementation uh, but I also recognize that talking is a form of advocacy because you always learn new things when you come to this kind of gatherings like I have so it's it, you know it's heartwarming for me I've had a chance to interact with Nitka and hopefully we can engage them more but really our support should be around understanding what is already happening in the environment and then finding a way to scale it with our doctor to patient ratio digital health in Nigeria is a no-brainer. We cannot access all these patients with the current patient-to-doctor ratio. So that's one of the things, right? It's not even, oh, it's a nice to have. It is the only way to democratize health in some way. What we need to take away from this forum is that we need knowledge to move the needle on the problem we face in Africa, whether it's digital, digitalization, interoperability. If we do not have knowledge, we are not going anywhere. We have seen for decades funding for different systems. And those funding come and grow and become in millions, and yet still the problem remains. So the only way is for us to have capacity locally to design, use, and then maintain the systems when they get deployed. I immediately expect from the government side to look into whatever is being recommended here that, uh, come, uh, that will come out as either a communique, look into it and pick those that need to be immediately implemented at the low-hanging fruit. Then draw a plan on how long-term sustainable plan can be deployed in collaboration and implemented in collaboration with the private and the public sector. The platform has provided that uh, collaborative approach and uh, I think it's just a matter of identifying what is being recommended here and uh, see to its own implementation. I think this is the point where we give, you know, eHealth Africa a round of applause, honestly. <laughs> um, that was quite interesting to, to watch, you know, um, Something that caught my attention was um, Dr. Emeka Chuko saying, you know, we need knowledge to move the needle if we are to solve um, any of the problems that we face, you know, um, in Africa. And I couldn't help but also notice um, um, Dr. Njide um, say that talking is a form of advocacy. You know, so for anyone wondering why are we, why do we have webinars, why are we having workshops, and the panel sessions and plenary sessions, it's because talking is a critical step in the building blocks towards creating solutions um, you know, to the problems that we have in Africa. And uh, this is one of such platforms. You know, We are here to share ideas, innovate, and who knows who will hear and who will be inspired to come up with the next um, best thing that will solve you know, the problem, maybe in maternal healthcare in, uh, in Nigeria or in Africa as a whole. All right, so I mean, it's time to jump into uh, the meat of the conversation. So my, my first question is going to go to um, the three panelists. And please, as you are listening, as you're following, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. If you are following us on LinkedIn, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comment section and then we have people who will pick up the questions and hopefully we have enough time to go through as many questions as possible. So this question is for everyone um, on this panel and I'm just going to you know call your name so you can take turns to answer. And it's a two in one question and um, here it is. So tell us more about your role and that of your organization when it comes to digital transformation in public health practice. So tell us about your role, your individual role, and that of your organization when it comes to digital transformation in public health practice. So uh, I would want Dr. Mecca to go first. Yeah, thank you very much, TJ Sue. Um, I wear many hats, so maybe I will just, um, and, and all of those hats have a lot of things to do with um, digital transformation. I'll start with, um, my work at Health Enabled. 
a senior digital health advisor at Health Enable, we support um, strengthening of the enablers for digital health system. Health Enable is not an implementing organization, but we support all of the enablers that supports when you deploy a digital system, whether strengthening the governance for digital system or making sure that the digital system authority country is uh, properly measured using uh, one of our flagship initiatives, the Global Digital Health Monitor. And I support that work. And um, the other role I play is as a co-convener of Digital Health Interoperability Network. We know interoperability, you can't interpret it yourself and think that you're successful. And we believe that it requires multiple people to talk to each other agree on standard, whatever that means, means that you need to still talk to other people. And uh, at uh, SON, as chairman of Medical Devices Technical Committee, we are advancing standards on medical devices. Actually, we just had uh, a major uh, uh, meeting earlier today, which was around standardizing assistive devices for uh, 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 people with disability. And so all of these help to transform uh, uh, um, how uh, information or how the health sector is digitized because these have digital in one form or, or another. And I, I contribute one way or another in, in, in these uh, different uh, initiatives. So thanks. All right. Thank you very much. That's really fantastic. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. All right. So um, Dr. Ifunaya, could you please you know, share uh, your own response, what your role is and that of your organization? Thank you to JC. I think it's very difficult to follow Dr. Emeka, but I'll try. So, um, thanks everyone. Of course, my name is Dr. Ifna Iludibe, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at EHA Clinics. And that means a lot of things. What, but generally, what it means is that I am in charge of ensuring that patients that come to EHA Clinics have quality health care that is safe, that is equitable is affordable and accessible um, at EHA Clinics. And EHA Clinics is you know, a chain of primary healthcare clinics that also has a community healthcare arm. And we're really on a mission to deliver quality healthcare that is of course accessible, is effective, it's affordable. And we do this by leveraging technology and digital innovation to provide a superior experience that improves patient outcomes whilst making um, pricing more affordable for patients. So at EHA clinics, we're you know, looking at how we can push the envelope of using digital innovation to improve patient outcomes, both in our for-profit clinics and our private healthcare clinics um, in Abuja, Kano, and Lagos, and in our REACH clinics. Our REACH is our community health aspect. And what we try to do is take all the quality work that we're doing in our private clinics and implement them in our community clinics because we believe that access to healthcare and quality healthcare should be equitable and not just depend on patients' ability to afford care. Um, different things, you know, we've run for the past five years. It's been an interesting journey. Um, we're the first JCI accredited ambulatory care facility in Sub-Saharan Africa. JCI is a Joint Commission International and um, it's a nonprofit organization out of the US that accred accredits um, healthcare organizations outside the US for quality standards. Also run you know, an ISO certified laboratory and a, a distribution warehouse for pharmaceuticals because we understand that um, care is a continuum. It's not just seeing a great doctor, right? If you see a great doctor and the diagnostics are wrong, then the patient doesn't have a good outcome. And if they get great diagnostics and the medication is wrong, then they don't get a good outcome. And that's what we look at, the end-to-end -end care of a patient, you know, to deliver safe care. So thank you so much for having me. And I'm looking forward to the conversation today. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Infunaya. Thank you for um, sharing that with us. Um, Dr. George, please, you're up next. Uh, thank you very much. So as TJ said earlier, I'm the general manager for GE Healthcare West Africa. And I would say in my role, um, I lead a team of employees, uh, leaders, 
um, and I empower them to excel as we work towards our mission and our purpose. And, and what is this work that we are trying to do? You know, um, our focus is really on leveraging cutting edge technologies to enhance diagnostic accuracy, um, improve patient outcomes and expand access to quality healthcare. Uh, and one key area we're advancing is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in medical imaging. Um, these are technologies that are enabling faster and more precise diagnosis, particularly in radiology where um, AI-driven tools can detect anomalies in medical images that might be missed by the human eye. Um, additionally, through our cloud-based solutions and data analytics uh, platforms, we're helping healthcare providers to better manage patient data and gain actionable insights. And this is particularly important in public health where real-time data can significantly enhance uh, disease surveillance, resource allocation, and overall um, healthcare delivery. And I'll say uh, also we're committed to expanding access to these digital innovations by working very closely with governments and healthcare institutions to build both the necessary infrastructure and the training um, to healthcare professionals. And by doing so, um, we're helping to ensure that look, the, the benefits of digital health are inclusive and reach even the most uh, remote and underserved populations. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. George. Thank you, everyone. Um, if, if for every uh, innovator or anyone who sees themselves as an innovator um, listening, if there's something I'd like to pick from what they have shared is the fact that um, digital as a word seems to be like an endless, you know, deep or an endless ocean. There's just so much that can be done. And, um, you know, seeing them talk about the unique, you know, areas of focus. I'm sure if we had more um, speakers today, we would hear more interesting and inspiring, you know, areas of focus. Um, so, Dr. George, I'm not about to let you off, you know, just immediately. Uh, I'm giving you the next question. Can you explain how you think digital innovation is transforming public health care delivery? especially in low and mid medium income countries? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, you know, and look, di digital innovation is radically transforming public healthcare delivery um, in low and middle income countries, you know, by addressing critical challenges and enabling more efficient, accessible and equitable um, healthcare. I can think of three, three key areas, right? Telemedicine, mobile health, um, electronic health records and, you know, big data, disease surveillance and response, right? Um, you know, one of the most significant impacts is the expansion of access, you know, to health services through telemedicine and, and mobile health. You know, these technologies are bridging the gap between healthcare providers and patients in remote and underserved areas where traditional um, healthcare infrastructure may be lacking. You know, in the intro video, um, Dr. Ifuna and I talked about the patient to, to doctor um, ratio. Uh, there is no way in which we can change that ratio via the traditional path um, successfully without leveraging um, digital health. You know, so for instance, digital platforms allow healthcare providers now to diagnose, monitor, treat patients without even the need for physical presence, you know, and this, significantly reduces both the time and the cost uh, uh, associated with traveling long distances for care. Um, another area is around um, electronic health records. And you know, electronic health records streamline the collection, storage, and retrieval of patient data. And this improves the continuity of care and reduces the risk of uh, medical errors in lower middle income countries where healthcare resources are stretched thin. You know, these efficiencies are critical um, in maximizing the um, impact of limited healthcare personnel, you know, and, and facilities. 
And then, you know, another big area is around digital innovation um, with disease surveillance and response. You know, mobile applications and digital platforms quickly gather data and analyze health data. You know, it provides real-time insights that are vital for uh, tracking and managing, you know, outbreaks. This is particularly evident during the um, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, where digital tools played a key role in monitoring the spread of the virus and, and, and coordinating um, responses. So look, in, in summary, I mean, digital innovation is really transforming uh, healthcare, like I said, if you look at, you know, EHR, if you look at, you know, telemedicine and mobile health and, and also around its applications towards um, surveillance and response. Thank you very much, Dr. George. I think that's um, quite um, insightful, uh, informative. So telemedicine, um, electrical um, health records, disease surveillance. And, you know, when you made reference to the doctor to patient ratio and how that it will totally be impossible for us to um, get a fairer representation of that relationship with the traditional uh, methods, you know, it just occurred to me that really digital is the way forward, right? Digital is the way forward. And we really, we really need to embrace um, this fact uh, that it will take digital tools for us to be able to um, achieve um, that sort of, um, what word will I, will I use now? Um, to achieve, you know, that future that we desire in terms of equitable, uh, um, access you know to quality health care even in uh communities and you know areas with low resources and all of that thank you very much dr george for um, for sharing that um my next question will go to dr ifunaya and uh, so so it's this covid19 seems to accelerate digital transformation in public health um, how can we sustain this tempo to better prepare for another pandemic. I mean, uh, all our listeners will agree in the, in the wake of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, there was a, a lot of resources being pulled together. Um, a lot of research was being fast-tracked, you know, different things happening um, just to enable us combat uh, the pandemic at that point in time. Um, but now that it's, there seems to be some sort of relaxation, what do we do and how can we sustain this tempo, you know, to better prepare for another pandemic? Thanks to Jesu. And, you know, it's so interesting that I got the COVID question because I did a lot of work in the COVID um, in those days, thank God. But I think one of the things that I think is so important is how we integrate those learnings into standard processes. You know, um, I'll use, you know, a framework that JCI has for things like um, infection control. And there's an established process and they're supposed to you're supposed to have a policy for managing epidemics pandemics emergencies and things like that what we should have taken for from covid is okay this is what to do in response to a pandemic and instead instead of just making it or oh, you know something that we go and pick up integrate it into our standard processes right integrate those digital tools into the things we do today so that if there's another pandemic in fact what will happen is that because those tools are already active, we'll even be able to predict the possibility of another pandemic, right? Another thing I think we should take away from COVID, another thing that we can use to sustain the momentum is, you know, we've talked a lot. I think almost every digital health conference I was at this year talked about interoperability and the need for us to be able to share data. You know, I remember during the pandemic, you know, we ran a level two isolation center, which meant that um, when patients deteriorated, we needed to send them to tertiary centers. And that was difficult because all of this needed to happen through paper. Um, people needed to get information. Sometimes these transfers needed to happen in the middle of the night. Um, one of the things that um, eventually happened as the pandemic developed was we developed a system, a case management system, where we would put in information for the patient, and this would be readily available to the next, to the referral facility. 
I think that was a great development and we should not stop. We should just look for how to extend that, extend the use of our digital health tools because patient care is collaborative, even within one facility, right? I need the input of the pharmacist to tell me, you know, what medications this patient is going to respond to. I need the input of the lab. So which means that even if I want to manage a patient mm -hmm. and primary care, if I need to refer this patient to secondary care, the doctor needs to have all the information they need to provide this patient adequate and safe care and not waste time doing the same test over and over again. So interoperability is no longer um, a good idea. It's something that we need to implement yesterday. Another thing to think about is real-time data analytics. One of the great things about COVID, if you remember, was that we got day-to-day real-time new cases, suspected cases, you know, what was happening, number of deaths, um, things like that. If we can implement that and continue that in looking at our health outcomes, is it possible today to have a dashboard of a local government in Kano State? I know how many patients are hypertensive and how many of those hypertensive patients are under control, right? Those are kind of things that we can extend. And during COVID, we talked a lot about public-private partnerships. There was no way the government was going to be able to test all the people who needed to be tested. There was no way we were able going to be able to open our borders with the requirement for testing if private organizations didn't come into testing. And we need to extend that, you know, in the, you know, in, in digital innovation to look at, you know. Dr. Uh, Lindsay Day said something so interesting at the Insight, Insight Learning Forum, which it was start private, go public. So what are the things that we're innovating in the private space that can potentially improve health outcomes in the public space and how do we take that um, there? And also looking at how we can create supportive legislature, right? Um, sometimes innovation is faster than legislation. <laughs> And, you know, now the government is running back to think about, oh, you know, now there are so many EMRs. How do we, you know, how do we enforce? How do we ensure that these EMRs are doing what they need to be doing? You know, being able to kind of preempt innovation rather than feeling like we're doing a fire brigade um, approach. And also a big thing is funding, right? Um, do we have funding available for digital innovation or do we just wait for there to be a problem, and then we fund it. So there are a few things I was thinking about in terms of how we can extend the learnings that we've had from COVID. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ifunaya. I think some of the questions that you have, you know, dropped in answering this, uh, this question of mine, I think they are questions that need to be answered, you know, um, by uh, people in leadership, the executive arm of government, legislature, uh, legislators, you know, and just um, public health leaders uh, in general. And like you rightly mentioned, some of the things I, I, I wrote down, the importance of integrating our learnings into standard, uh, you know, processes, the need to share um, data, just like you rightly said, that patient care is largely um, collaborative and also making reference to uh, having real-time data, you know, those are important things that we need that needs to become um, the norm for us, you know, and, and this will make us prepared for another pandemic. Thank you very much, Dr. Mifunaya. Um, the next question is for you, sir, Dr. Mekachuku. Um, what areas do you think we are lacking in when it comes to investment to promote digital in innovation? In what areas do you think we're lacking when it comes to investment? Thanks. To Thank you very much. Um... By virtue of my work on the Global Digital Health Monitor, we're able to map the seven enabling environments for uh, digital health in multiple countries, not just in Africa, globally. And uh, a theme seemed to be emerging, that's capacity. And that's when I started becoming an advocate of capacity. Um, so capacity to regulate for the regulators, capacity to design systems. I mean, even when systems are open source, um, you still need people to understand the code and then know whether to make change in it or, or support the system. And we even lack 
some basic capacity of digital literacy to use technology by healthcare professionals. So that's an area that has the greatest need. Of course, uh, somebody could argue that what about electricity, internet, the computing hardware? Yes, those remain low. But if you ask me, the area that we need that has the greatest need, because almost all African countries ranked two or five across board when it comes to capacity. For instance, most African countries do not even have digital included in their health workforce in service training. So when you are, they are training the health workforce uh, to, to come and then become physicians, nurses, and midwives, they are not embedded. Of course, there is a measure of ICT one here and there, but they are not systematically included. And this is something that is a big issue. Of course, I've mentioned the infrastructure. A lot of countries in Nigeria, Africa, uh, is doing well when it comes to digital health governance and the, and the policy formulation, but not necessarily the implementation of the policy. Uh, well, I don't want to overflog standards and interoperability. It's still a big issue, but I still think that when people have capacity, they will even be able to have a conversation and understand the conversation and design their tools in a standard way. So um, for me, it is capacity. But of course, there are a lot of other problems. Like in Africa, we have wicked problems. But if I'm going to start, I would suggest let's start from capacity, then we'll, we'll be able to tackle the rest. Thank you. Awesome. Capacity. Thank you very much. That's that's quite an interesting submission. And I'm tempted to follow up with questions that are, you know, are not even on my list of questions right now. But let's let's I'll, I'll hold my question and let's hope we have time and I can take you up on that, uh, you know, that answer around capacity. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emeka. Uh, the next question is for Dr. George. Uh, briefly, can you share with us what are some key components of digital transformation in public health that you are aware of and you'd like to share with us? Yes. Um, we've touched on a whole bunch of them already in the, in the course of the discussion, right? Uh, Dr. Fnaya pointed out that there are a lot of EHR systems in Nigeria today. Um, but look, the, the biggest opportunity is mm -hmm. in getting these various systems to talk to one another, right? So one of the most critical components is the integration of EHR systems. EHRs consolidate patient information, you know, across various healthcare settings. You know, when you're able to do this, then you can ensure that healthcare providers have the most comprehensive, the most up-to-date um, information about a patient, which is essential for accurate diagnosis and treatment, right? And this is the way in which we reduce the risk of medical errors and drive patient safety. Uh, um, another critical element is around big data and analytics, okay? So when you're talking digital health and you're talking public health, you know, it's really around our ability to gather a vast amount of health-related information, okay, which would then lead to insights that can improve decision-making at, at both the individual patient level, but also in the broader, you know, um, uh, public health strategy, right? You know, so, for instance, you know, predictive uh, analytics can help in identifying potential outbreaks before they become widespread, you know, and this allows for much quicker intervention, right? And then the, the third component, which I'd like to um, uh, highlight is around the integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning into healthcare systems. You know, this is revolutionizing uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment, okay? Um, and I would say emphatically, Computers will never replace doctors, right? Um, but, you know, every doctor needs a virtual assistant that looks over their shoulder and gives them a, um, a, a different point of view, right? Or even confirms or validates their own thinking, right? So AI-driven tools can analyze medical images today with very high accuracy, and support clinical decision making, right? And even predict um, uh, patient outcomes. So the whole bunch of 
of components. Uh, but you know, when I when I think about it, this these three are quite critical um, in really leveraging the uh, and exploiting the opportunities of digital transformation in healthcare as it relates to public health. Yeah, that's that's interesting, Dr. George. Um, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, predictive anal analytics, integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning and um, integration of EHR systems, you know, interoperability. Thank you very much. I mean, those are some um, key components of digital transformation that Dr. George has shared with us. All right, um, Dr. Ifunaya, um, what are the ways we can measure the impact of digital innovations in public health delivery? Um, can you answer that for us briefly, that three minutes? What are the ways to measure? Okay, <laughs> I will try. I think what's what's great about this panel is that a lot of what you know a lot of us are saying the same thing and going into the same conversation how do you measure impact why do patients go to the hospital right to get good outcomes so if we're not able to measure healthcare outcomes how can we know that the digital innovations are giving us the impact right i, I made mention of is it possible for us to know from a primary healthcare center in Tofa local government area, what number of hypertensive patients they have and how many of them are controlled, right? Then we're able to probably design better interventions. So that is what I look at as impact. I look at the quality of care, right? When patients come, you know, are we able to track things like surgical site infection rates? Um, are we able to track things like um, medication errors, right? and things that affect patient safety and ensure that patients do not come to harm at going to healthcare facilities. When we look at impact also, we want to look at access to care. I mean, we've overflogged the issue of the doctor-patient ratio, but you know, how do we get more patients seeing more doctors looking at the fact that the brain drain or JAPA is not ending anytime soon? Um, it's not just in Nigeria, in the Western world, every, every country is experiencing physician and nursing shortages, right? So how do we improve these access to care? If we have a telemedicine platform, are we able to say that this telemedicine platform, because we have it, we would have seen 10 patients, but now we can see 200. How are these innovations improving overall efficiency at the healthcare facility? Are we getting you know, better medication? Are we able to track the supply chain to make sure that patients are getting vaccines that are not degraded? You know, are patients waiting too long in facilities and how do we use that data to improve how patients access care? Um, is the innovation able to target cost effectiveness? Of course, we know that a majority of the population lives under $1 a day. So whatever innovation we need to be targeting in Africa has to be looking at making healthcare more affordable. And the impact from any digital innovation we should be looking at is how is this making care more affordable for patients? And a big one we maybe don't sometimes consider because I mean, there are no doctors, so do we want to track customer satisfaction? You know. The study recently came out that 95% of patients, their first point of call when they're sick is to a PPMV or a chemist. What does that mean? It means that they're not actually necessarily satisfied with what they're getting in hospital, right? So yes, we're not looking at customer satisfaction because we don't have enough doctors, but our doc do our patients even trust us? And looking at those customer satisfaction metrics and looking at how we can improve right, using those digital innovation tools to make either care more safe, more effective, and make patients trust us better. Another one is how can these digital innovations help us to adhere to standards? You know, I talked about JCI. There are so many accreditation standards, so many standards of care, so many benchmark processes, right? How can we achieve better patient hand hygiene, right? How can we achieve better antimicrobial stewardship rates and how are those, you know, how can we use our digital tool to measure the impact of those things? And of course, usage metrics. It's very wonderful to create a tool 
but nobody uses it? How do we know that people are using or not using? And are we humble enough to see that when they are not using it, are we humble enough to change and pivot and make it something that is more usable? So I think these are a few things I had in mind when I was thinking about this. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Dr. Ifanaya. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. All right, um, Dr. Emeka, uh, how do we document and advance discussions and outcomes of various digital health forums for improved advocacy? You know, like Dr. Ifanaya was mentioning when she was answering um, the question around COVID-19 and she mentioned, she said a lot of the conferences this year, you know, um, had something to say about the digital transformation that came about as a result of the pandemic. So there have been a lot of conversations, a lot of conferences, workshops, meetings. Um, how do we put or bring all of this together? You know, how do we document and advance this, the outcomes of these um, conversations for improved advocacy? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Ifunanya and uh, Dr. George, because um, they have already highlighted some of this area, and uh, especially when it comes to collaboration towards interoperability. So yes, one way to do this is to start the conversation, like this insights uh, 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 webinar is a very key area because first you need to create the awareness create the appetite for people to collaborate. And when you create an environment like this, it, it makes it uh, easy for uh, that partnerships to be um, uh, ignited. And then uh, we want uh, people who are also participating or digital health practitioners should be open to collaboration, not just speaking about it. And the reason is no single system by itself will achieve the health goals because you need to track the patient through the continuum, whether, and you need to use shared services, whether it's the identifier for patient, the identifier information that is coming from a healthcare a provider, regulator like MDCN or a midwifery council. If you need the system to be efficient, you need all of these shared services. Then your point of care system, and I, I use point of care very broadly here, it could be EMR, it could be uh, a, a sensor driven a medical device like the GE uh, uh, ecosystem, or it could, it could be anything. It could even be a primary health care uh, tablet thing. But the important thing is that that point of care system is an isolated thing. But if it plugs into the ecosystem, it's, then that's when uh, it, it makes the greatest impact. So how do we document this? We continue what we are doing, but then change our attitude a bit. Create knowledge management repositories, create environments where we go a little beyond talking, like what we do at Digital Health Interoperability Network. And this is the same problem we are trying to solve. So we try to create an environment where we go a bit hands-on, beyond, okay, yes, we want to interpret, but what does that mean for developers? So, okay, we want to interpret, you take on a use case and say, okay, what do we do to change, to move information from hospital A to B? It may seem small. You say, okay, for a referral. So what do we move? Developers will tell you that this could be a three weeks discussion and a, a lot of work. And this is the kind of conversation we need to move to. So have the high level conversation for awareness, but then take it to the point where you can then start touching code. Again, my background, I'm an engineer. So I like to move from talking to doing. So I feel like this is very critical. And then document that so that while your use case may be immunization, another person can then copy that and create a network and do their own use case on uh, hypertension or something else. And then we, we build the momentum. And even in advanced economies like the US, they have network of networks. You don't, some of the networks are around uh, uh, particular health programs. Some of them are built around states. Some of them are built around a particular uh, uh, ecosystem, a set of a, a network of hospital. We can just start something, but we need to move forward with, with, with a lot of this work and it needs to start. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Emeka. I mean, I'll say a big thank you to all the panelists because I see them trying to just cramp all their answers quickly into the short time available. There's so much to say. And I want to apologize, you know, that we have to put you on your toes. All right, so what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to ditch my lineup of questions. I see that there are questions from the people listening, and I think it just makes sense that we um, devote the next 10 minutes to answering questions. So I'm going to have, I mean, all of you answer at least one question each. And so let's try to make it, skip it, let's say, two, three minutes tops so that we can take at least three questions. So the first question, I'll put that to um, Dr. George. So um, this, this is from Jamil Ahmad. Uh, thank you, Jamil, for sending the questions. He says, health workers are key partners in the digital health ecosystem. Many health workers feel threatened by digital health interventions with the palpable fear of taking over their jobs and hence their relevance. How can these fears be allayed so that the health workers adopt and they can expand digital health services? I think it's a great question, Dr. George. Um, yeah. Um, and as I said in the beginning, it's a great question. And it's a it's a very important topic, right? Um, as, as I said when I was speaking earlier, computers will never replace doctors, right? Computers will never replace midwives, um, health extension workers, that, that will never happen, right? Um, but computer systems, uh, artificial intelligence can enable us to do our work better, more accurately, um, uh, safer, and more efficiently, right? So I would encourage my clinical colleagues um, not to fight this uh, revolution, if I, if I call it that, right? Um, but to embrace it, okay? Um, we talked about earlier the fact that uh, digital education is not something that is part of our curriculum as medical uh, students. That needs to change, right? We all have a responsibility to, to develop our digital literacy, right? Um, and to look for ways in which we can, you know, leverage digital transformation in, in our work, right? Um, because ultimately it makes us better. Okay. So so I think that the fear for or the fear of uh, digital transformation is um, is misplaced. You know, computers will never replace doctors, but but if we if we interact and use the systems better, we can be a lot more we can be a lot better at doing the things we do. Thank you, Dr. George. Thank you so much. Um, so just talking about digital literacy, I have this question and I'm going to push this to Dr. Mecca because he was the one that spoke about capacity earlier. So this is from Ojuma Chika. She's, uh, this person says, I'm a pharmacist currently building my data analytical skills and planning to further my studies in digital health at an international university next year, as it is not yet offered in universities here in Nigeria. What measures can be taken or are being taken to incorporate digital health literacy into the Nigerian healthcare education system? Additionally, are there opportunities or programs available for early career healthcare practitioners to acquire these skills locally? Um, so Dr. Emeka, can you just quickly um, you know, give a response to this question? Thanks, and this wonderful question, um, there are things being done to um, uh, incorporate digital uh, uh, literacy in the healthcare program. I, I know notably the work done by um, uh, uh, one government agency, Health Records, Health Records Board. Yes, I think I remember Health Records Board. They are trying to work with the uh, NUC to see how they can integrate this into into uh, the uh, um, the the practice, medical practice, and both for physicians and for nurses. And there's a lot of conversation already going. I know the Ministry of Health also has such plans. Many of them have actually gone very advanced. And I think it's something that will happen soon. For how you will um, improve your skill, I think you're already in the right track. Definitely keep at it. Um, I would suggest since you are doing um, uh, data science and you are looking to try your hands out, um, use um, there's a, a website called Kaggle. Kaggle is where you will see 
example data to try out analysis and simulation. You see healthcare data uh, from a lot of countries, use it, test your hand on those data science uh, 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 tools. You can even take it a step further, try out machine learning and AI, and you'll be ready. By the time you go in, you'll then um, move in. It's a good career path, very rewarding. So I will encourage you to, to do that and any other person who wants to. Thank you, Anova. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Mecca. Please, you can do us a favor in the chat box. Just write out that uh, website or platform so that people can see it. Um, this one will be last question. Just two minutes to Dr. Ifenaya. And so this is from Gabo Ron. I, I hope I pronounced the name well. So this person is asking, what is your perspective on chronic kidney disease screening pilots in public health? Does digital innovation have a role to play? If so, how? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Chronic kidney disease pilot. I think, and you know, just thinking about the increase in the number of chronic kidney disease, and probably this is the reason why there are now more pilots and looking at how um, digital innovation can play a role. I think it can, but I think we need to look more, not necessarily from patients who have chronic disease already, but predictive analytics, right? We know that, you know, chronic kidney disease um, is a complication of um, chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, right? Can you use data analytics within primary healthcare facilities that already collect this data? And that's why electronic, med electronic medical records are so important, right? Because they're able to aggregate data. If I look at the percentage of um, hypertensives that do not um, are not controlled. Am I able to predict using analytics, you know, five year in five years' time, based on this poor control, these patients have the chance to develop chronic kidney disease? And the same thing for diabetes. I think that is where digital health innovation and data analytics are important. You know, of course, there are different things like collecting samples, microalbumin samples, and using that to see. Um, if patients have already developed, but I believe that the future of digital innovation is not to wait to see disease. It is to wait to see the potential to have chronic disease because for the most part in an African setting, how many of us can afford one day dialysis? So the problem is not setting up more dialysis centers, right? Where people can actually have dialysis. It is how can we accurately you know, get patients in to do annual health checks, get that data about hypertension, potential to have hypertension, family history, and use that to predictively follow patients and say, you know, adjust your lifestyle, try not to get chronic disease, chronic kidney disease and things like that. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ifenaya. I have one more question. I think I cannot close without taking this question. I think I think I need to, and it's for you still. Um, this oh, person is... Oh. And this person is asking, how can public health organizations balance the need for data sharing and collaboration with the need to protect patient privacy? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, um, organizations like NDPR and HIPAA in the US ensure, you know, have got stated guidelines um, in terms of um, how data can be anonymized um, and ensure that patients' privacy are implemented. Uh, that being said, you know, one of the most important things um, as a healthcare practitioner, you need to be very transparent in your use of data and what, your, what patients' data will be used for. Um, like at AHA clinics, one of the, you know, we have a consent form for every new patient and they have to, there is a box that says, you know, um, I don't want my data to be used for research or I want my data to be used for research. And patients who take that box have said that I've opted in or opted out. So that's one way, you know, you're getting patients consent for the use of um, data. And of course, there are still, um, it, there are certain diseases of public health interest, being able to ensure that patients understand that some of that data needs to be communicated in the interest of public health. Um, but of course, consent, 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 um, and of course, um, anonymization of data, you know, in the protection of patients' rights. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ifunaya. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to, it's already 4 p.m. and we'll, we'll be drawing the curtains. But just before we do that, I'd like to give Dr. George and Dr. Mecca uh, about one minute each to just share, you know, their last thoughts, uh, you know, final thoughts. What would you like to leave the audience with? Um, so Dr. George, could you go, go first, please? I think you're muted. Yeah, when I think about digital, um, the biggest opportunity is for us to get systems to talk to each other, right? That is when we start to paint the most comprehensive picture of our patients. And that is when we really can, you know, drive patient safety, right? So so that is what is top, top most of my mind when I think about digital. And I think that's what I would like all of us to collectively advocate towards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. Dr. Emeka. Final word. On my end, yeah, thank you. On my end, uh, given that I work mostly around interoperability, I'd like to draw us back to that often uh, over over uh, stressed uh, word. So when it comes to interoperability, I'm beginning to see that sometimes we ask digital to do things that we are not currently doing. When we collect information, since information sharing across hospital is very important. When they are collected in paper, I would assume that we will do all that is necessary to share it even in paper form. But we are not even doing that at all. Yet, as soon as you introduce digital, you start to, uh, you start to expect what is not happening in paper to start happening in digital. The same thing when it comes to privacy. The privacy you are asking for digital, is it happening using the paper form? And I think that's, where our orientation may need to change slightly because let us enforce things in paper and manual form and then know where digital is a problem and where we have dropped the ball on enforcing on processes. So that's my uh, closing wow. word. Dr. Mekas, I'm about to open another fresh can of you know <laughs> conversations, but that, that was really interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Fina, you know, final, you know, just close. Uh, this the final words. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy, you know, that Dr. George and Dr. Emeka have touched a lot on this in the interest of patient safety. Um, digital health innovations are here to stay. I, I, there's this book I love, it's called Who Moved My Cheese? Um, and one of the um, takeaways from that book is change is constant. Digital health is here to stay. Um, if we do not adapt, we will become extinct. Um, it will advance beyond us and we will not be um, employable. So I just wanted to use this opportunity to just uh, encourage my colleagues, you know, who are resisting digital health. It's almost like you're just resisting the use of WhatsApp right now, right? <laughs> it's here to stay. And the sooner we're able to understand that and provide the skills that they need to adapt to the new, the changing environment, and also be open to, you know, learning new things and improving in our healthcare delivery. As Dr. George says, um, computers will never take a delivery. Computers will never come and give vaccines, but they will help us give vaccines or take deliveries that are safer and will have better healthcare outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you to our audience, uh, everyone that's connected and is listening. Um, we really appreciate you. Um, our panelists are active on LinkedIn, so you can type their name, follow them, um, you know, see what they're up to around digital health, you know, and innovation. You can ask them questions also. I'm sure that if they are able to answer, they will provide um, you with befitting answers. And also, if you're on this uh, webinar and you're not following eHealth e Africa on our social media channels, um, you are wrong. Um, so please follow us on all our social media channels. We're active on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on X, formerly Twitter, and on Facebook. Please follow us so that you can... Uh, be aware of the things that we're doing, you know, innovative ideas and you know milestones that we're um, reaching per time. Please follow us. I want to say a big thank you for staying and being a part of this Insights webinar. 
Um, like I said, follow us on social media and um, we'll be having Insights Webinar, the 25th edition next month. So please look out for when we put the flyers out and please register. And also, if you enjoyed this webinar, if it was if you found it interesting, informative, please you can share on so your, your social media channels and tag us. Um, you know, I learned XYZ at the Insights webinar. I had this information. I was inspired to take this step. I got this answer. Write it on LinkedIn. Tag eHealth Africa. We might, we might reshare it. You never can tell. And also invite um, your friends, invite people on your contact list to be a part of the next conversation. Let's make this community bigger, better, and stronger. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you and bye, everyone. Bye. bye.